So let's talk about types of credits. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for those who are on, this is not a virtual PD. Um, you are allowed to shut off your camera and mic. I'd prefer if you shut off your mic because you're not gonna have to talk anyway. Um, there will be a lot of Jessica and not so much of you. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but that's how it's gonna be. Um, this is more of an old school traditional webinar, so you won't need to interact with one another um, or participate. It's more just sort of set and get style. Um, I will definitely try to answer your questions throughout, but it might not be immediately as soon as you ask the question, but you guys can feel free to answer one another's questions in chat. Um, and it does indeed still count for one hour of NGPF Academy. Um, today we're going to do a little bit of intro. I'm going to give you a bit of a what I'm calling a portrait of credit in 2020 through the lens of our semester course. We're going to specifically talk about because this is about brushing up on content. We're going to talk about tap to pay as well as installment payments. Those are kind of newer things that might not have been around the last time you did a, a brush up on types of credit. And we're going to briefly touch on credit card laws. And then towards the end, I'm not sure that we'll go over all of them, but I've created um, and curated a list of my faves in this unit specifically for remote learning. Um, so very quickly, my name is Jessica. I am one of the co-founders at NextGen Personal Finance. Uh, I, prior to joining NGPF, was the principal of a high school in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and way back in the day, I was a math teacher. Uh, so I come from a a long history of in-classroom teaching. I've never had to do what you guys are doing right now, which is teaching remotely um, to students. So my, my hat goes off to all of you. I will also share that much like all of you, I am uh, barricaded into my house right now uh, with a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and a seven-month-old. So we will see if they leave me alone for an hour. Um, wish me luck here, folks. <laughs> Let's go ahead. Let me really quickly uh, check the chat here to make sure mm, yes i will send you the presentation when i am finished all right let's get rolling here um so want to start us off with a question of the day you're not gonna answer out loud or anything but excluding home loans what are the three largest debts for american consumers um and you can see at the bottom of the slide this one was updated in January, so it's a pretty recent set of data. And as you can probably guess, largest other one other than home loans is student loans, after that auto loans, and after that credit card debt. So it's interesting because you hear in the news tons of stuff about the overwhelming amount of student loan debt out there, and that is in, indeed true. Uh, but you also hear a ton about credit card debt, and it's, it's actually number three on this graph. Um, I will pop us out here um, onto the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's site, because I really like it. Um, that data chart in that question of the day came from this cool little interactive that updates quite frequently. Um, I mean, yes, quarter one of 2019 is the most recent, but in terms of graphs, uh, you can see they, they update pretty regularly. And you get housing debt and non-housing debt. You click here, you get that chart that we were just looking at. And then you click here and you see what percent of balances are 90 days delinquent um, uh, across a bunch of different loan categories. So uh, it's one of my favorite sort of like, it's not, I wouldn't call it an interactive, you can't do much on it, but you can kind of chart the progress. Um, it's a great little exercise in looking at data. So that's one of our questions of the day. And then this one, came actually from a data crunch instead. How easy is it to get a loan? So we just looked at loan debt across the US and currently up through 2019, these are the rejection rates actually. Um, so the higher the bar, the more people get rejected for that type of loan. Um, so you can kind of see that uh, basically in this four year period, there's no real trends um, other than mortgages started to get uh, a bit more common, like it was a bit easier to get mortgages, but now you see in 2019, they kind of shot back up a little bit. Um, if I know uh, in the recent surge of folks teaching online, NGPF has gotten tons of teachers brand new to our resources. Um, so bear with me if you've been with us a long time, um, but I just want to show you, I mentioned that that comes from a data crunch, 
Um, a data crunch is a one page activity that always features one chart or graph. In this case, that one I just showed you. And then five questions that scale up according to the depth of knowledge levels. Um, so these two first questions are level one, then you've got level two and level three here. Um, these are really great resources if you are in a school currently where you need to be able to print out work for students to do because essentially everything they need to do is on this activity sheet right here. So you could just print it and they don't need to be able to click to anything else. They don't need the internet. Um, so data crunches on our website are a great place to find printable work essentially. Okay, let's head back to my slides here. And then let's also look at consumer debt by age currently. And this is up through quarter three of 2019, also for the New York Federal Reserve. Um, you can kind of see, I think there's so many good, interesting questions you could ask your students about this. Again, you just see that mortgages basically fill up everybody's middle age, um, not so much for super young people and not so much for folks over 70, um, but that whole middle tier is just filled with people paying their mortgages. Um, I think another kind of interesting thing is that auto loan debt stays pretty consistent, um, as does credit card debt across all of the groups. And if you think about it, it's, um, it, it's sort of true. You don't really need a more expensive car the older you get. Um, you might choose to get one, but you don't need one. So uh, it kind of shows that folks sort of stay in about the same uh, debt level for their car, um, or at least compared to the other types of debt. And you'll also see that the light blue here is student loan debt. And as you would expect or hope to see, it's pretty um, large in early in life and then sort of trails off um, as people pay off the student debt. And I saw in the chat there that somebody said that they had just finished uh, paying off their student loan debt. So congrats to you if anybody is in that boat. Um, I want to take a minute and again, I think um, we've experienced a surge of folks brand new to NGPF. If you've been around for a while, you have probably seen this video before, but I want to take the opportunity to show it. Yeah, I see in the chat, um, somebody said this video is awesome. Um, my kids are still talking about it. That is awesome. We have actually put this one into Edpuzzle too. If you are somebody who um, has never seen Edpuzzle before, I'm going to kind of show you how that works. This is just a YouTube video. You could get back out to YouTube by clicking uh, this link right here, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, play this video for you. And again, uh, it's getting lots of votes of confidence in the chat. So even if you've seen it before, it's always a nice refresher. So I'm going to hit play and you guys are going to hear it um, hopefully on your end. Everyone knows these plastic things called credit cards. They're fast, convenient, and they use percentages to make you feel good about giving money to credit card companies. Here's how they work. Everyone likes to buy stuff. Stuff costs money, but not everyone has all the money they need to buy all the stuff they want exactly when they want it. Credit card companies are lending you a certain amount of money to buy stuff now that you'll pay back later. That's called a line of credit, hence the word credit card. You agree that whatever you spend on that line of credit, you'll pay back in a certain amount of time, usually a month. At the end of the month, when it's time to pay up, credit card companies give you options to pay back what you owe to make things easy on you. You can pay it all back or you can pay back a little. The catch is Okay, and then if you've never seen an Ed puzzle, the way it works is it pops up a question, a multiple choice question um, on the side here. So it stopped us there and says, which best describes how a credit card works? Um, and it randomizes the order that these questions are in. So it won't be in the same order for all of your um, I am not going to take the time to read these. I'm just going to check here and we'll see if I got it right or not. Submit. And you can see I did not get that one right. And it tells me what the um, correct answer is over here. All right. And then I will be able to, um, oh, good questions. Um, yes, you can search the title in the Edpuzzle library. Um, you can find this Edpuzzle in our video library on our website. If you go to resources and choose video library, you can see it there. And in terms of monitoring your students' work, you would need to set up your own Edpuzzle account and you would need to uh, get your students loaded in and uh, push this video towards your students. 
Um, oh, some, Denise gave you a workaround. If you don't want to use um, Edpuzzle, you can have the students screenshot their answers and send them over to you. Um, and yes, Holly points out that there is a virtual PD tomorrow on using Edpuzzle and NGPF. So if you'd like to learn more, that's the perfect one to, uh, to attend. Let's continue with the video. The catch is that the easier options actually make it harder to get rid of your debt. You actually end up paying more than you spent, way more. And that's exactly what credit card companies want. Consider this. Let's say you've got a line of credit for $3,500. Let's say you pay for stuff with your credit card all month. A little here, a little there, a movie, some clothes, a meal, another movie, a new smartphone with a big screen, and a five megapixel camera, and a thing, and a blah, blah, blah. The more you buy, the more you are using your line of credit. And by the end of the month, this is what you owe. Now, you have a choice. One, you can pay the whole thing off. You do this, it costs a lot, it feels bad, but the credit card is reset, and you are free to live it up again. No fees, no charges, next month. Basically, you paid exactly what you spent. All right, again, I'm not gonna bore you while I read these answers and try to get them right. You can see I got that one wrong. I hit continue. Two, the other option is to pay a little bit. You're letting the credit card company know that, hey, I can't give you all the money I owe, but here's a part of it. This is the minimum you can pay, which feels great because you're not losing a big chunk of money, but it doesn't get rid of your debt completely. In fact, it's how credit card companies make their money. Here's where percentages come in. If you just pay the minimum, you still have an outstanding balance that you owe this. Now right. Awesome, I got that one right, here we go. Now, when the new month starts, and by the way, your credit line is not fully restored because you still owe money. Whatever your credit line is, minus your outstanding balance, that's how much money you can spend each month. Okay, back to our example. You've paid the minimum and it's a new month. A percentage of what you owe gets calculated. This is called interest. And it's simply a percentage of your outstanding balance. And at the end of this month, this interest gets added to what you owe. Now, you owe what you still owed last month, any new money that you spent, plus interest on all of that. And then again, you have the choice of how to pay it off. And for this illustration, we're going to assume that you max out your credit card every month. Let's say you pay the minimum again. A new month starts, you buy stuff, and at the end of the month, interest gets calculated again. And if you keep buying stuff and you keep paying the minimum, the interest will keep getting calculated and keep getting added, and all that extra money goes to the credit card companies. That's how they make their money. And that's how you can get stuck in a never-ending cycle of debt. Yep, and you can also somebody. Credit card out. companies aren't all yep. bad. They are going. lending you the money. Even if you just pay off the minimum every month and never bought anything else, you'd pay a lot of interest, but you'd eventually pay off your debt. That's because the minimum payment is slightly more than the interest. But imagine you had a company that loaned you money, but where the interest was always more than your minimum payment. That's exactly what many companies that offer payday loans do. Mm -hmm. While credit card interest rates are like 11 or 24 percent. Payday loans often have interest rates around 200 or 400%. With interest rates that high, debt can easily get out of control really fast. Stay away from companies that offer quick cash loans because their ridiculously high interest rates can trap you in a cycle of never-ending debt. Two, in the eyes of a credit card company, someone who pays off all their debt every month and never pays a late fee, that person is called a deadbeat because the credit card companies are not making any money off of that person. When it comes to credit cards, you want to be a deadbeat. So, pay back everything you owe and pay it back on time. All right, I wanted to show that one because I think probably it is my all time favorite video uh, that NGPF has stumbled across. Um, I have not seen any other video describe credit card debt that well, as well as explaining what the paying the monthly minimum is. So if you've never used this one with your students, it's a good one if your kids have Wi-Fi at home to assign for them to watch and either do the Ed Puzzle or not um, from home. Um, but it, once you return to the classroom, it's also, also a really good one to show in class. Um, okay, and that one you can also find in semester course lesson 5.2 about credit card debt.
In lesson 5.3 of our semester course, we're talking a lot about how young people can get credit. Um, here's four different ways that young people can start building their credit. Um, if you're new to NGPF, we, um, I know uh, Dave Ramsey in particular is a big fan of like teaching avoid credit at all costs. NGPF doesn't take that stance. We kind of go more with the educate your students fully about credit so that they understand how credit cards work, how loans work, how mortgages work. Um, across the board so that they can make educated decisions for themselves and so that if they do decide to take out credit they understand sort of the responsibility that goes along with that um, so you'll find throughout this whole unit lots of resources about uh, how you get credit how you build credit how you maintain credit um, so this one came from uh, an infographic that ngpf made in conjunction with visual capitalist um, and i will let you know that um, when you get my slides, every single image you see is clickable in the sense that I took this screenshot from a um, infographic and if you click this screenshot, it'll take you out to the whole infographic. I want to take a minute talking about secured credit cards, though, because this is one when I first joined NGPF, I had to do some some reading up on how secured credit cards work. Um, so essentially, if you're going to get a secured credit card because maybe you don't, maybe you already have bad credit somehow, or maybe you have no credit history and you want to start a credit card, it might be hard to get an unsecured credit card, which is like the quote unquote normal credit cards. Um, so a secured credit card, what you do is you essentially give the company the money that becomes your credit limit. So you're sort of providing your own cash collateral, if that makes sense. I know cash and collateral don't normally go together. But so if I want a $500 credit limit, I give the secured credit card company $500. Um, and that becomes the maximum that I'm allowed to spend. However, it is not a prepaid card. So if I give them $500 as my, my collateral, um, and then I go buy a shirt for $50. Um, it does not take the $50 out of the $500 I've given the credit card company. It's not a prepaid card and it's not a gift card. Essentially, I will then receive a monthly statement where it says, hey, Jessica, you have to pay the minimum balance on your $50 credit card balance. And so maybe the minimum payment is whatever, $10. I have to pay that and then it works just like a normal credit card. I make my minimum monthly payment. It carries over the balance. It will charge interest. Um, I still have the rest of my credit um, card limit to spend on. It works exactly like a normal credit card. That $500 remains untouched unless I essentially like default and stop paying my credit card. So unlike a prepaid card where you're spending down that balance, that balance in this case is just sitting there untouched as security for the fact that the credit card company took a chance on you without having much credit history um, in case you default and then they can use the money that you gave already uh, to, to pay off your debt. But otherwise you are supposed to treat it like a normal credit card and make the minimum monthly payments. It goes on your credit report, it gets counted towards the credit, or it gets reported to the credit bureaus and you start building your credit history. So I'd like to point that out because it's a common misconception. People think that you, you secure it with that $500 and then draw down that $500 and you actually don't. Um, in and the rest, sorry, and the rest of lesson 5.3 about how young people can get credit talks about some of the other options like be getting a co-signer, becoming an authorized user on somebody else's credit account, or if you are somebody who takes out student loans, beginning to pay, make payments on your student loans um, so that you begin to start building a credit history. Um, Moving on to, to 5.4 in our semester course lessons, um, this the whole lesson is about selecting a credit card. And I just thought this graph, um, which is from that lesson, is kind of cool. It shows you uh, sort of two quarters a month where average APRs have been. And I think it's kind of interesting um, and maybe expected that the existing account APRs are lower than the new offer APRs. Um, and probably because credit card companies wanna make sure they make money, maybe because if you're a new account holder, they don't necessarily know what your credit spending um, and reliability for paying back is going to be. Um, but I think this is a cool one. And then the rest of the lesson um, walks students through how to select, like the steps for selecting a good credit card and sort of 
teaches them not to fall for the like, oh, it's 0% APR, it must be a great credit card, or oh, it's got like really good points or airline miles or whatever. Um, not that anybody can fly anywhere anyway right now, uh, but it sort of walks them through what they should be looking for in a credit card. Um, from semester course 5.6 about auto loans, my two favorites, which I'm not gonna show you, um, you can click when you have the slides, is this activity compare auto loans. If you've ever seen it before, it's the one that has like a, a Jeep Cherokee at the top and she's, she's seeing offers for how she can get great loans um, and sort of walks through this scenario of like, can she afford the payment? You use a loan calculator to determine that. Um, and then of a total student favorite is this video. It's weird because it's from 2010. So at this point it's a decade old, but it's so good about how to haggle for a used car. And I don't, other than that credit card video, I don't know of another video I've ever shown students where they've been like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we watched that video because uh, it really does show you some good tips for how to haggle on the price of a car. Um, so if you haven't already, I would say check out that activity, but also check out um, the haggling video. And one of our brand new data crunches about um, uh, sorry, this is like a bit of a misnomer. Um, the lesson is about student loans, but this is about uh, why student or why college students and recent college students use their credit card. So it, each line is a different group. The yellow is current college students they surveyed. The green one is people who have recently completed college. And the blue line is people who were enrolled in college and left without their degree essentially, and sort of a comparison of why um, each of those groups reports that they use their credit card, whether it's for online purchases, whether it's for emergencies only. Um, it's I'm kind of like, as I said, a former math teacher, uh, so I kind of nerd out over charts and graphs, and I think this is a really, really cool one, and there's so many good questions. Um, the data crunches have five questions each, but there's so many good questions you could ask about this graph. And then finally, in 5.8, we talk about mortgages. And again, um, I'm supposed to be helping you brush up on your content. So if you're super, I mean, maybe you have your own mortgage, but maybe you took out that mortgage decades ago and you don't even really remember the ins and outs. Um, there's a really great infographic. I think this is from Business Insider. If you click, you'll see even more sort of comparison chart. Um, but essentially this idea that you can get a fixed rate mortgage, um, which is, a bit less risky, um, or you can get an adjustable rate mortgage. And essentially, um, depending if it's like five, three, five, seven, ten 10 years, um, it'll stay constant for that first time period and then it'll switch once a year. So it's a bit riskier because, um, you know, if you get a 7 1 arm, for example, oops, after seven years, you could, um, your rate could go a lot higher and then your payments could become less affordable. Um, okay, yes, somebody, um, I am realizing in the chat that if uh, I go too far without answering questions, I don't see them all and I don't wanna waste your time while I skim them all, but I do see, is there fine print for reading a credit card statement? And there is indeed. Um, yeah, the, a lot of people warn against adjustable rate mortgages. Um, they, are, as I said, they can kind of uh, really bust up your budget or put you in hard turn times if uh, the rate goes a lot higher, your payments go a lot higher, and then you can no longer afford your house. So in general, I think if you're trying to teach your students to make conservative decisions, most people go for the uh, fixed rate mortgage. Oops. All right, moving on. Um, this little section here again, um, so that was sort of a walkthrough overview of each of the lessons in our semester course and sort of a broad scope overview of some data on where different types of credit are currently in 2020. Um, but I wanted to take some time to hit on some like newer topics, um, one of which is tap to pay. And if you're an NGPF veteran, you already know what a FinCap Friday is. You may have already even seen this one. Um, but my colleague, Yanelli, uh, does these amazing FinCap Fridays that come out every Friday on the blog. Um, basically, what they start out with is a five-question Kahoot. We are not going to play this Kahoot right now. Um, there is also, 
If we go back here, if I click here, there's a no tech version, which instead of playing the five question Kahoot, you get, um, you get five slides that ask the questions and then multiple choice and then the answer uh, is highlighted. Um, so if you want to do it with no technology in your classroom, you can do it that way too. And then Yanelli creates a like one minute explainer video on the topic of the day. So this one is about tap to pay. And I figured why would I explain what tap to pay is when Yanelli does such an amazing job. So I'm gonna again, play this video. This one does not have a ed puzzle to go along with it, um, but it's only a minute long. So we're gonna go ahead and watch it together. Whoops. I'm Yanelli Espinal with another FinCap Friday brought to you by NextGen Personal Finance. When you think of somebody paying for something in a store, you probably picture them handing cash to the teller and getting a receipt back. Or maybe you picture them using a credit or a debit card to swipe or insert their chip and then give their signature. In a lot of different countries like Sweden, Australia, and Canada, even here in the US, lots of adults don't do any of that stuff anymore. Instead, they use contactless payments or tap to pay. That means they use their smartphone, smartwatch, or their credit or debit card to tap at checkout and then they're done. Tap to pay takes about 13 to 15 seconds to process, and that's twice the speed of a regular debit or credit card transaction. Visa actually just announced that they're gonna be releasing all of their new Chase credit cards with contactless payments. Customers are gonna be getting a new credit card in the mail, which has the little tap to pay symbol on it. If you're shopping around and you see that same symbol at the checkout station, that means you can simply tap your card and go. Visa says they're releasing these cards to make transactions fast faster and easier for their customers. But a lot of people might still be skeptical. So here's a couple things you need to know about tap to pay. It's really unlikely that you're gonna pay for someone else's transaction by mistake. In order for your payment to go through, you need to be about two inches or closer. If you make a series of purchases using tap to pay, then you'll probably be asked to enter your PIN number. This is one of the ways that they're gonna be enforcing fraud protection. Research shows that when people use credit cards, they usually spend more money than they would if they were using cash. So just be careful that tap to pay doesn't make you spend more money than usual this holiday season. Awesome, and then each, um, each FinCap Friday has a discussion prompt afterwards. Like if you were doing this in your class, after you watch the video, you can ask your students like, hey, turn and talk to one another about whether you would use contact payments. You could, you know, depending how old your students are, uh, you can also ask them, have they already ever used it before? And what's the experience like? And then Yanelli also always provides a bit of extra resources that you could use to support more learning, either for you yourself as the educator or for your students um, about, the topic, in this case, tap to pay. I also, it is not the same thing, but as you saw in Yanelli's video, um, your, your credit card can have the little tap to pay logo and you can just tap your credit card in order to pay, make your payment. But you saw a lot in the video that people were using their phones. And so I wanted to touch on digital wallets as well. So this would be something like Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Pay, depending on which kind of smartphone you have. And essentially, with the digital wallet, you can set it up kind of with any card in the background. So like in some places, like if you get a Target um, gift card even, you can load your Target gift card into your digital wallet and use your phone to pay. Um, but in general, people either can attach their debit card or their credit card. And essentially, the say, if you put them in your digital wallet, the same um, terms and agreements essentially uh, of using your debit card. So if you load that in and you tap your debit card um, at like a store, uh, it's gonna pull the money right out of your checking account just like any other debit card purchase would. If you set up your credit card, it's gonna make the credit card, um, it's gonna go onto your credit card bill and then you're gonna have to pay it off either all in a lump sum or uh, your minimum monthly payments. But you can set the digital wallet up with either type of card. Um, so in a way it connects to credit cards because that's one of the options you have. Um, with most digital wallets now they have a way that you can pay vendors like you saw in the video um, or that you can pay people with a person to person payment um, usually using like uh, messaging. So basically you can message people money at this point. Um, 
using a digital wallet provides a little bit of enhanced security because unlike inserting your credit card or tapping your credit card where it's reading your 16 digit number, when you use it on your phone, it's creating a one time use code that will only work during that one time. And that's what gets transmitted to uh, the vendor and what they submit to, in order to get their payments. So the, the store never has your 16 digits. Whereas if you insert or you swipe, it's reading your 16 digit number. Um, with the digital wallet, it's instead just reading the one time use code. If you, again, digital wallets is not the exact same as tap to pay, but it's one way that you can tap to pay. And if you want to learn more about mobile banking and payment apps and, um, and, uh, and digital wallets, I recommend checking out our semester course 2.4 lesson, which again, this is a link when you get my slides um, and you can learn more about digital wallets. I'm constantly checking my watch because I don't want to go over. We're a little over halfway. If you joined to be late, a couple things. Um, I want to take a break to say, yes, this will count towards one hour toward either your NGPF Academy swag or the, um, the attend five virtuals get an Amazon gift card, which expires this um, Friday. Uh, so yes, this does count, but this is not a virtual PD. In most of our PDs, you need your camera on, your mic on, I'm gonna, they would normally put you into breakout rooms, you would talk to one another, you would do stuff. This is more traditional, old school style webinar. I'm basically the only one from our organization offering those. So if you see my name next to an event, it's probably gonna be a webinar like this, where I'm just kind of explaining content to you and providing you with resources anybody else is going to be a much more interactive experience. So depending on whether uh, this is your style or not, I just didn't want you sitting here thinking like, when are we going to do the fun stuff where we interact with one another? It's not going to come. Um, I had sent out a PDF copy of these slides in the chat already. Um, if you didn't get it, maybe somebody put on their computer can shoot the link out in the chat again. Otherwise, when this is all over, I, this is being recorded. Um, so I will send you a file follow-up email with the recording as well as my slides. Um, and just so you know, I'll say this now, do you have to take the survey at the end in order to get the one hour of professional development? So make sure you stay until the end. Cool. Let's also talk a little bit about installment payments because they are a new thing that you may have, it's kind of a a new rendition of an old thing. Um, think sort of like about layaway where you sort of made incremental payments and when you made the whole payment, uh, you got the item. This is kind of the opposite. You essentially make uh, usually one quarter of your payment and they give you the item, but then you're still on the hook for the other three quarters of the payment. And again, this is one where we have a FinCap Friday. So I'm going to let Yanelli go ahead and explain this for you. Um, and again, it's only like a one minute video. I'm Yanelli Espinal with another FinCap Friday brought to you by NextGen Personal Finance. When people are shopping for an expensive purchase like a car or even a new phone, many of them do not choose to pay for the item in full upfront. Instead, they choose to make a number of smaller payments over time. But now it's becoming more and more popular to do this, even when buying smaller, less expensive things like a sweater or a pair of sneakers. New fintech companies like Affirm, Afterpay, and Sezzle are taking advantage of this trend and offering installment payment plans at checkout in thousands of in-store and online purchases at stores like Walmart, Nordstrom, Urban Outfitters, and Ulta. But how does an installment payment plan work? Well, the most popular way is that a shopper pays one-fourth of the full price at checkout and then makes three additional payments of 25% over several weeks. Some companies charge a flat fee and may charge interest on the purchase, but others offer 0% interest, making the installment payment plan free for shoppers. But the companies will make money either way because they charge the seller a fee. Sellers want to increase their sales when people shop online because they know a lot of people abandon their car at checkout for a few different reasons, including that the price might be too high for them. Younger shoppers, both millennials and Gen Z, are really the ones using these installment payment plans the most, especially those who use debit cards. One well-known installment company called Afterpay said that 91% of their users between 18 and 23 used debit cards to sign up with them. While this may sound great at first, 
installment payment plans can be pretty dangerous. So here's what you need to know. You might feel like you're off the hook for fees because you're using a debit card and not a credit card. But if your future payments don't go through, then you could be charged late fees. And if you owe a balance for too long, then the amount could be reported to a debt collector, which can really hurt your credit score in the long run. Installment payment plans play off of our desire to have things so badly that we don't actually calculate whether we can afford it, especially around the holidays. People feel a lot of pressure to spend to buy gifts for their loved ones, even if they can't afford it. Even though some of these services may come with a 0% interest rate, it's important to remember that as a shopper, you're still borrowing money, which probably means that you're spending a little bit more than you can afford or that you're spending more than you're comfortable spending all at once. So um, this, I, one of Yanelli's resources from this slide here is this money.com article. And I pulled this part out um, because essentially it answers one of the questions I had, which is where, what's the catch? Where are you paying extra? And the, the, the point that Yanelli made is you might not actually be paying any extra. You, um, if they don't charge you a fee and if you're not late with any of your payments, um, and if they don't charge you interest and you bought an item that was $40 and you paid $10, $10, $10, $10, you still have paid the $40. Essentially the store that let you do that paid a firm some money. So that's how a firm is making their money. Um, but I labeled this slide like not predatory. So this is not an issue of like they're tricking you and all of a sudden you get hit with tons of fees. That's not really this model, but it just kind of enables your spending. It makes it very easy. As you know, they said in the video, if you're like, Ooh, these new sneakers are $200. I don't have money to buy $200 sneakers. Oh, but I could just pay $50 now and 50 later and later and later. Um, the idea is that you might make a snap purchase that you otherwise would not have. And that's what your students have to be really careful about, that they're not spending a little bit now thinking like, oh, these are manageable payments, when really the, the greater issue is perhaps they should not be buying $200 sneakers in the first place. Um, but if you look when you're shopping online, if you look closely at the checkout, many of them have these little logos now that enable you to do um, sort of these installment payments. Um, and it's just something I feel like that has crept in in the last maybe year or two. Uh, but once you know to look for it, you'll see it on more and more places, essentially. Um, the one good thing is it does, uh, most of the companies do report to the credit card agencies. So it's a way essentially for young people, it's another new way for young people to sort of start building up their credit history as long as they make those payments on time. Um, but again, it's this slippery slope of if you do this too many times and all of a sudden you're, you're one you know, $10 payment, then you also have another one that's like a $40 payment, another one that's a $60 payment, and all of a sudden this idea that you were gonna spread out a large sum of money now has you paying a large sum of money each time too. Um, I want to take a few minutes to go over credit card laws um, and we have an activity called research credit card laws web quest. Um, I think this is another one if your students have access to Wi-Fi that's kind of a fun one to for them to do um, while they're remote learning. Um, Sorry, I would not say fun. It's not super, super exciting, but this is a very accessible one because essentially it's asking questions like, um, describe this law in your own words and how many days do you have until you um, credit cards can increase your rate and uh, how old do you have to be? So essentially it's something that's very, very manageable that they shouldn't need much handholding because they should be able to Google for all of these answers. Um, but again, your students would need access to Wi-Fi at home. Um, Card Act of 2009, I highlighted this first one um, because if you went to college before 2009, um, which I did and many of you may have, um, you may think like, oh, and you might tell your students anecdotally, yeah, you go to credit, you go to college, the first thing you're going to see at orientation is all these credit card companies signed up, they're going to offer you like a, a beach towel and a lanyard and some sunglasses if you sign up for their credit card and they're going to give you credit cards, um, even though you're young and you don't know what to do with them. And that may have been the case pre-2009, 
that's significantly scaled back. And I'm not going to make the mistake of saying that nobody under 21 can get a credit card because that is not true. Um, but that huge onslaught of all of the credit card companies going after really young, impressionable, like 18 year olds away from home at the same time is a bit different now because the card act of 2009 basically said, if you're under 21, you either need to have a co-signer or you need to prove that you're independently employed. So that's, um, again, some, uh, our intern Ren has said before that he was able to get it just by sort of proving that he was employed by NGPF and had a steady source of income because he had been working for us for a while, even though he was, you know, part-time hourly. Um, but it, it is a lot different than if you went to college pre 2009 or even, you know, just went sort of anywhere pre 2009. Um, it's harder for young people to get credit cards. And I really like to point that out because so many times I've heard teachers talk about how like their main thing is they're going to prepare students for that, that freshman orientation where they're just going to get bombarded by credit card companies. And that is less likely to happen now. Um, the card act also has some other core things. Um, credit card companies have to wait, uh, have to give you 45 days notice before raising your rate. And they also have to give you at least 21 days from when they send you your statement to when your bill is due. The Fair Credit Billing Act um, basically gives you 60 days to dispute a charge that's on your credit card and sets it up so that $50 is the maximum amount you should be liable for if a stranger uses your credit card. That is not the same as if they use your debit card. Um, this is applying to credit cards. Um, there's other stuff in the Fair Credit Billing Act too, but those are the two main ones. Um, and I will also say along the $50, a lot of credit card companies won't even make you liable for that amount, but Fair Credit Billing Act set it at $50 max. Um, and then the Truth in Lending Act basically is what created the Schumer box. If you are new to teaching personal finance, um, uh, the Schumer box is essentially this thing that you may have seen on sort of credit card agreements. It standardized the way that important information um, needed to be displayed about your credit card um, and sort of pulled out information so that this core stuff about your APR, your penalties, your late fees, et cetera, was no longer allowed to just be completely buried into fine print. Of course, it's still important to read the fine print, but the Schumer box does pull that out in sort of a bit more accessible a way. Um, okay. Here we go. We're now at the section where the grim reality is that most of us are not going to be in, back in our classrooms for a while. And I wanted to, um, there's, there's perhaps no one on the team. I don't know. Sonia might challenge me on this, but there's maybe nobody on the team that knows all of our resources with such a uh, keen photographic memory of what's on all of them. So I did you guys a favor and pulled out the ones that are pretty easily adapted to teaching remotely. So here are three that you can print out that they do not need access to anything. Um, and you can just kind of give them these as a packet and there we go. Similarly, somebody in the chat, and again, I've realized with so many of you on here, I can't really monitor that chat very easily. There's way too many scrolling things. So I will cycle back through them um, after the webinar completely ends and I'll try to get in touch with anybody that I can that I realized didn't get their question answered by somebody else. Um, but we have these things called a fine print. I'm going to show you the mortgage one because I just um, redid this one. So this is a brand new mortgage bill example. But what a fine print is, is we give you a source document. Um, so in this case, it is a mortgage billing statement. Here is the initial part. It continues on to the next page. Here's the next page. And here's the little part that you would detach if you were gonna mail in a payment. And then each fine print essentially has 10 multiple choice questions. The students, um, I mean, they need to know some information. If they have no idea what a mortgage is, they could still do this, but it's kind of like, why are you, if, if they have no clue what a mortgage is, why are you having them read a mortgage bill? Um, but all of the information, um, 
in each multiple choice question is taken from the bill itself. So the idea is to teach your kids how to read the fine print and get them some practice reading the little details and looking for fine details here. Um, so we've got 10 multiple choice questions. And then at the end, there's always one summary question. The 11th is always kind of a summary of what they've learned by doing that fine print. The fine prints are something, again, that if you need to create packets, um, you can. Uh, the other option is, if we scroll way up here, you'll see if you prefer to administer it using Google Forms, which is sort of the auto gradings um, feature on uh, Google, you can look in our answer key document so uh, if you have an NGPF teacher account, you were already emailed the answer keys. If you don't have a teacher account yet, you can sign up for one. You have to prove that you're uh, a teacher. So you need to provide us with like your staff directory that has your name and email on it or some other way of verifying that you're a teacher. Then you get the answer keys. In the answer key document for this fine print, you will see a link to a Google form. And if you wanted to assign your kids remotely, if they have Wi-Fi, you could give them this and it's all loaded into Google Forms. So the document that they need, the, um, the billing statement is loaded into Google Forms, as well as the 10 multiple choice questions. Um, hold on one second. I'm going to mute whoever that is. A lot of work done. Whoopsie. Hold on. Hospitals. Ooh, why yeah, can't I get there? Uh, if you are my friend, I've lost my Zoom control. If you're my friend who is not muted right now, hold on. Okay, sorry. Took me a second to get my controls. Um, okay, so again, you can, uh, everything will be loaded into Google Forms. You can assign it to your students in Google Classroom or however else you're managing your Google Forms. If you don't know anything about Google Forms um, or Google Classroom, we've got virtual PDs on all of those topics too, um, but the kids could answer and it'll auto grade all of the multiple choice at least, and you could decide what to do with question 11. You could grade it yourself or you could um, just not assign that one to them. But the fine prints are some of my, my absolute favorites. And we've been going through every month and updating. Uh, the reason we're doing types of credit webinar right now is we just updated all of our resources in our types of credit. So that's why you've seen new data in our data crunches, new fine prints or improved fine prints and some modifications um, and improvements to our lessons. Um, so the whole types of credit unit has a, a fresh new shiny coat for you. Also data crunches, which I showed you an example of earlier. Um, here are two more. Data crunches can also be printed without needing any Wi-Fi. Um, and these two, these three, I think, I have heard a lot of schools have basically put in place this weird middle ground where you're required to give your students things to work on, but they can't be new material or material that is essential for the course, like you can't teach brand new core material. Um, so I thought these three are great as kind of enrichment, because if you have students that can't do them or just don't do them, they're not going to be woefully far behind in your core content of your class. Um, so I thought these were three good options if that's kind of the boat you're in. One is to play our interactive from the arcade um, Shady Sam which covers all kinds of different loan types and is uh, a student favorite. It's got kind of cool old school video game graphics too, which is kind of fun. Um, the second one, Analyze Alternative Lending. This is sort of has the kids go out and do independent research on an alternative form of lending. So not getting a loan from the blank and not getting a credit card, but things like Lending Tree or Kickstarter or um, that these sort of like online options that are not tied to a bank, a credit union, a credit card company. Um, and this is something that probably not very many of you might cover in your core curriculum, but it's kind of a cool topic for students to learn about because these are the ones that you hear ads on the radio all the time, like no credit, bad credit, you can you know apply for a loan with X. And then the third is a debate about should college students have credit cards? Um, there's a whole bunch of resources that the kids can read that then walks them through making points and counterpoints to prepare for a debate. And then you could figure out a way to either 
do the debate once you get back to school, if you get back to school this school year, or maybe you have an online platform already set up where the kids could debate online. Um, so I just thought this was a cool one. If your kids have Wi-Fi at home um, that they could maybe uh, work on that was not essential learning necessarily. Here's where you find more, our types of credit unit page. Again, I know some of you are very new to NGPF, so I will show you this. Here is our types of credit page. Um, on the left-hand side, you will see all those semester course lessons that I was talking about earlier. A lot of folks are not in a place right now where they can teach a whole unit worth of lessons remotely, but if you are, those are over there. If you scroll down further on the left, you get our full year lessons. The semester course lessons are 45 minutes each. The full year lessons are much longer and they go into more depth on each topic. And then the right side is where you get all of these sort of accessories. Some of them are embedded in lessons already, but some of them are totally outside of lessons. And you can always click view more and you get a whole range of um, activities here. Here's a case study. Here's the FinCap Friday, some of which I already showed you, questions of the day and data crunches. Um, when you are looking for resources, if you're teaching unit by unit, I can't emphasize how much I love going the unit page route. So if you click curriculum and click units, essentially like in my mind, this is how I think as a teacher, I'm not just randomly looking for like data crunches about any topic. If I'm normally teaching, I'm like, oh, I am teaching the budgeting unit. So you click there and then on that one unit page, you'll get all of the materials NGPF has for budgeting. So in my mind, these unit pages are the very best place to go. Um, I also, uh, again, somebody asked earlier where you can find that credit card video. It's in our video library, which you could get to by going resources video library. Um, our arcade games, the two that have to do with credit are Cat and Sanity, uh, which is a very lighthearted one, very fun, and Shady Sam, which I discussed. And there you go to Arcade and choose Arcade Games, and you will see um, all of the different uh, arcade games that NGPF has to offer with an estimate of how long it will take to play each one. And each one also comes with a reflection worksheet, um, which you could or could not assign to your students. I will also call out for all of my fellow math fans, um, we have started whoops, creating um, these awesome activities called math. They all start with math. Abby, my colleague, creates two videos to show the kids how to do that type of math problem. And in this case, it's about using the actual like um, uh, equation to figure out what monthly loan payments would be. So they kind of look like this. Abby has the two different um, videos about how to use the equation yourself. And then if you scroll down, here is the equation written out for students. And then she's provided practice problems. So if you are somebody who needs to or wants to infuse a lot of math skills in your class, our activities that start with the prefix capital math um, are a good place to look. I will now go ahead and provide the survey link for you. You must complete the survey in order to get credits. Um, let me get it out to everybody in the chat. So navigating your Zoom so that you can see the chat, hopefully you're all there. And I just put the link to the survey. Um, again, I will differentiate this one more time. <laughs> this one was a webinar. So it was designed to be just me explaining content. Um, it was not meant to be interactive. So I definitely don't need the feedback this one wasn't as interactive as the other ones because all of the rest of them are virtual PDs and are meant to be interactive and this one was not. If you prefer the virtual PDs, you are very, like, you are very welcome to go ahead and tell me that. Um, but I just don't want you to be like, oh, I was expecting tons of interaction and Jessica didn't do any of that because this one wasn't meant to be like that. Um, let's see. Okay, let, as people are typing, let me, um, you, okay, so good question. Do you need to log in to take the survey? You do not need to log in, but you need to use the same email address that you use to register for the webinar. If you used your personal email to register, you need to put in your personal email. If you used your work email, you need to put in your work email.
Um, but very happy to have you stay on the line to ask me questions. Um, and I will also put this virtual PD slide open so that you can see it for now while people are taking their survey. Um, in case you're looking to register for more online events, most of which are indeed much more interactive. Oops, I just lost the slide. Sorry, folks. Okay, I've got some folks asking for the survey. Here it is again. You do indeed get credit for this webinar if you take the survey. Thanks, Lo Lois. Luis, sorry. <laughs> Lois, Luis, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm also happy if you want to unmute yourself and ask me questions out loud. I am happy to answer questions out loud at this point if you want to unmute yourself and ask me something. A uh, good question about whether the resources can be used for middle school. Um, lots of teachers do indeed use them for middle school. Um, they typically have to sort of adapt them somehow, especially because our lessons sometimes require a lot of reading. So sometimes you have to scale those down. The other thing I will say is that we are very excited to be releasing a full nine week curriculum for middle schoolers. The full thing won't be done until July, but our first release for that is coming out next week and it'll be um, two of the nine units ready for you guys to look at next week. Um, but you're also welcome to use these high school ones for middle schoolers as long as you're able to adapt. Jessica, can you just explain one more time the Google Forms? that they self-correct and how we do that? Because I've always just printed out a hard copy when it's been like a 10 question yep. um, quiz thing or even the, the um, exit tickets. I'd love to be able to do that directly online, especially now. Yes, absolutely. Let me um, quickly, you're gonna see the inner workings of the huge NGPF folder here. Um, I will say that I will give a very quick overview of this, but then we've got lots of online resources that can give you more explicit directions on this. But um, let's go here. Um, folks who are asking about other surveys that you didn't take for other virtual PDs, can you email info at ngpf.org if you're trying to follow up on um, if you're trying to follow up on PD that you previously did that you didn't get credit for, way better to email info at ngpf.org. Okay, I'm answering the Google form question too. Okay, let me sort of, um, so basically on the teacher side, your Google form will look like this. And then on this, and we've preloaded all of these in, so you would be able to access this um, through that answer key. And essentially then when the students look at it, it looks like this and they have to fill in this stuff. Hold on a second. And then here is the billing statement for the mortgage. They can also um, click here and pop it out into a bigger window so that they can see it better. And then here are the questions loaded in. Um, and then they would just go through and answer like this. And then, hold on a second, let me do this really quickly. It, it, all of these questions are required, so it's not gonna let me submit it if I don't fill them all in. So let me just randomly. And then here is that short answer, like blah, 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 blah. And then I submit it. Um, and then essentially on the teacher side, you now see over here, I just have one response to my um, Google form. And I can see that, hey, look at that. I got three out of the 11 points. Um, <laughs> and it self-graded uh, the assessment for me. And you can sort of set it so that your students get their scores immediately or you release their scores later, um, whatever you want to do. Uh, that's a very quick overview, but the, um, and you would basically 
get it for all of the people that took your, your Google form, essentially. Um, and you can view it by question, you can see summaries, you can see individual um, kids' answers as well. Okay. So I can send you a link to where you can find more information about how to use Google. Well, that would be great. Help. Yep. Um, let's see. Okay. So Linda, I see that you cannot um, get the survey to work. Right. Um, one I, thing you can do is it may have gone through. If you have it filled out on your screen, you can screenshot it and send it to me. Otherwise, just email me, jessica at ngpf.org and let me know that you were here. So, so Linda. Selinda, so yes, I, I can't actually, I'm trying to open it in another window because it doesn't, it's not like the Nearpod ones, right? In Nearpod, it just comes up for those PDs. Huh, it won't, it won't even let you open it? No, I can't. It, it tells me there's an error. I mean, I'm opening in another window. Weird. Okay. Yeah, just send Jessica at ngpf.org an email and tell me you were here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Actually, Jessica, can I chime in? Yesterday I had that happen and I waited for about 10 minutes after the session ended and then I just went to that same website and put my information in at work. I think it's just oh. overrated. <laughs> okay, is, is there a specific, thanks Jill. Is there a specific like a code for this, um, for this webinar? No, just no specific code. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I had a quick question about the resources, if there was anything available on the Microsoft Office platform. I know you've mentioned a bunch of things with Google and Google Forms, and our school at this time is using Microsoft Office. Is there anything related with that suite of products? Um, no, not explicitly, but you should be able to, on any of our documents, to go to like file and download and download okay. it as Microsoft Word. Okay. And long as that works for whatever system you're using, you should be able to do whatever you want with that then. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Just yeah. a great job as usual. Thank you, Mary. Um, the, oh, Holly raised her hand. I don't know how to call on you. If you know how to unmute yourself, Holly, you can just talk to me. Um, but somebody, Tom asked, is the presentation available for us to review? Yes, let me give you, hold on, let me see if I can get there real quick. Um, I'll give you the link again to get the PDF right now so that you don't have to wait for it. Um, but otherwise, uh, I will email it to you afterwards in like a closing up email. But let me give you the link right now. Here's the link to the PDF of the slides that you can access right now. And then otherwise, I will email it out later. Jessica, would you put that problem up again, please? The math problem? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, sure. I like that. Jessica, are student teachers able to get teacher accounts through NGPF as well? Um, yes. We, uh, are you the student teacher or are you the cooperating teacher? No, my sister is a student teacher. I was just telling her about this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, yes, but we need like somebody to vouch, like we need some educator to vouch for them to verify them because it's really easy for students to be like, yeah, I'm a student teacher. <laughs> um, so as long as somebody can be like, yes, this is a real teacher or is going to be a real teacher. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, M is monthly payment. Jessica? Yes. Um, hi, thank you so much. Um, I said on my survey, it's awesome to like see your face since I've been using, you know, when you oh. the Google Docs and like you see your name, it's like, ah, um, but on, on the email that you guys sent out like last week, maybe about the updates to the credit oh. unit and the things that you said, will it show in the bottom, like what lessons have actually been. So like if you updated the data crunch mm. and new data crunch in the lesson, will that show on the updated date at the bottom of the lesson? Ooh, great question. Um, no, because in the case of the data crunches, um, what we did is we changed the content that was on the page, but we didn't change the link. Okay. So for example, yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. Okay. So if a that, that's, how, that's how I've been gauging. Like, so I create a, a I use the like add to my drive, your original things. So mm -hmm. it's in Google Drive, I have a like original NGPF folder 
and then I create a copy and make my modifications and then I go back and I look at those dates at the bottom. Yes. So, so there might actually be updates in the so do you know like specifically which lessons have been updated, I guess? So mm -hmm. we in terms of this update, we didn't update any lessons. We okay. only updated um like on the anything that on the unit page would be on the right hand side may have gotten an update. So like over here, hold on, let me get I, I, I understand what you're saying. So that's why the link would only be updated because it was that original document that got updated. Yes, exactly. Okay. So like, and the got link it. stayed the same. So like if this activity, like analyze, categorizing credit yep. in a lesson, the content here might have changed and indeed it did and the date here changed, but the lesson okay. itself won't so, have so I'll just So I'll just have to dig deeper in my looking at the last updated. Um. Like dig deeper by look by clicking on the actual link in the lesson. Yes. If you okay. yes, if you have your own copy of this activity and your own copy of the lesson, you'll need to um, dig deeper to see did this activity yep. change. If you don't have your own copy of the activity, if you only change the lesson, then you're fine. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Holly. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Can I ask you a question, Jessica? Where would I go to find out if I've received credit for these uh, mm -hmm. virtual yes. presentations? So one thing I will tell you is that we have gotten um, such a huge increase in people participating that we're a little bit, the system is a little bit laggy right now. So like if you attended something at 1 p.m. today, it might not be up there yet just because our system is so overwhelmed, but that doesn't mean you're not going to get credit for it. But okay. essentially up here, see how on my screen it's like, welcome Jessica, and this is my account. Uh -huh. If you click my account and then you click um, my NGPF Academy over here, uh -huh. it will show you here's what I am registered for that's still upcoming. And here are all of the events that I have already attended. All right. Okay. Thank and you. Yours will be the same. And then um, it'll tell you how many total credits you have. And then it will, there's also this link if you see an error. But again, basically we are so overwhelmed right now. If, <laughs> if, you, if you attended something in like, I would say like the last five days and it's not there yet, maybe yes, give it another wow, few wow, days. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It was good. Real good. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining me today. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I, it's, uh, it's Celinda. It's Celinda again. I, I just want to let you know I, I figured it out. I found it. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Celinda. I'm glad it worked. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. I really appreciated uh, this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, so if I do an activity and um, use this for my students, but I put it, let's say, on like Google Classroom or something where they can electronically have access to that activity, is it okay if I just put the link and not like the whole worksheet thing as per each section? Um, so you're saying like in Google Classroom, is it okay to like just put this activity not the whole lesson is that what you're asking like if i took like the um i don't know like i'm thinking of like if i took this worksheet for example and said like okay the math auto and mortgage monthly payments and then just put the link to get to this part could i do that or should i just put the whole like activity that you've already constructed on on google um are you asking, are you allowed to, or technologically, is that how you should do it? Are you allowed to? Oh, allowed to, yes. You can use as okay. much or as little as you want. So, like, for okay. example, if you just want to put, like, Yanelli's, the video that I showed you, and you don't want to put, like, the whole FinCap Friday, you just want to post the video, yeah, you can use bits and pieces for sure. Okay, and then it's just to, just to maybe um, document or put somewhere like ngpf.org. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you are purely just using it with your classroom students, um, we're less particular about it. It's more like if you're going to give a presentation to a bunch of teachers, we don't want you to like strip off all of your logos and it's like, oh, I made this myself. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. 
Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. It was just for my classes, but yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Thank you. This You're welcome. Great. Hello, Jessica. I noticed that you had the Kahoot mm -hmm. incorporated. How do you get that in the lesson? Um, like, uh, you're asking like, how do you get like assign a Kahoot to people to students? Yeah, like how do you get into the slide and then, you know, I see that ah. you have it on the slide, so I don't understand how you. Yep. Okay. Get that. Um, <laughs> see, you're you're gonna push me to answer questions that I'm not 100% awesome at. Hold on a second. <laughs> um. So essentially, we would click this link here. Mm -hmm. Here is the Kahoot itself. And, oh, okay. And That's how you do it. Okay. You, and then you log in, right? Exactly. Like you would need to have a Kahoot. Um, yeah. You do it the normal way how you uh, log in and you exactly. already set all of your lesson plans up already in a Kahoot. It's just that you're pulling it in. Exactly. Okay. Yep. It's already set up for you and you just pull it into your account then. All right. I understand. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> you're welcome. Okay, Meg, you should also not give me all that much credit because um, we have a babysitter here too watching the kids. It's just that sometimes they go, they they revolt, especially the two-year-old. She throws a tantrum and then like, you know, shimmies her way in and all of a sudden is up in my business. So thank you. My kids were awesome this time, um, but I, I do have somebody trying to help too. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, Cindy. Um, so does do webinars count toward the five or just virtual PDs count toward the five? Webinars count toward the five, yeah. As long as you took the survey. Okay, then the other thing is I've taken I've had some of these surveys, I've done some of them before, but I did one yesterday and I don't know how my camera, why it doesn't work. Do you have any idea? Like your camera's just not working? Yeah, like I don't have you can't see my picture. <laughs> mm, and these are great questions. Uh, hold on. So the best thing I can do is, there's no way for me to show you the Zoom controls, but on my Zoom, there's like a little thing that looks like a microphone. When, I'm, when I talk, it goes like green and white up and down. I don't know if you see that um, on your Zoom controls, but there's another one that says like video right next to it. Do you see the little thing that looks like a video projector? Okay, it says stop video. Yeah, okay, see the little carrot, like the downward facing arrow next to stop video? Yep. Somewhere there, like in those video settings, like I just pulled mine up. I don't know if you can see my screen when I do Zoom, but yeah. like that's okay. kind of the settings. So maybe you can play around with those. Okay, because I have easy camera on. Okay. All right, I, I will work on it then and see um, why it doesn't work. But yeah, okay, it has the settings in here. So I'll just have to work on it. I just don't know. All right, yeah. cool. Okay, that's the yep, I thanks. can do on that. Thanks, it was really, I, I learned a lot of things today that I never I didn't know before. Like Ed Puzzle, that's great. Yeah. It's just a great thing to do. I super like it because even without the question functionality, it take something, you know, on YouTube, it's usually like all those ads are on the side and all the extra videos that they're recommending and you can see the comments and Edpuzzle like strips all of that out. So I think it's like a little less distracting for the students because they're not like, oh, look at all this other stuff I can click on. <laughs> right. That's it. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Anybody else? I still see lots of people on the line here. Anybody else have questions they want to ask me? Jessica. Yeah. Um, how do you decide, there's so many different activities and things to do. How do you decide what's the best ones to use if you're short on time or I know you can't possibly use them all. Is there a <laughs> way to figure that out? <laughs> is, there, is it written somewhere? Like I know you gave us some tips today about which ones are favorites, but it's always a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> great question. If you're Jessica, you've seen all of them so many times, you just remember them all and you dream about them. But um, <laughs> that's not very accessible to other people. Um, 
personally, okay, so one way to do it is, um, let me see here. Okay, so here's one option I can tell you is at the top of this categorizing credit, see how it says like teacher tip video right here? Um, and that's yes. a link to a YouTube video. Um, so this is like Amanda Voltz, who's a teacher in Michigan and an NGPF fellow and a long time user of NGPF. She creates a teacher tip video of, of the activities that she's done in her class and tells you how to implement them. Um, like not tells you that you have to do it the same way, but she gives you tips on like what worked really well or what modifications she made. So in a way, I've and watched not, several of those. Yeah. yeah, and in a way though, not ev like not every activity has those teacher tip videos. So if there's one there, that means Amanda used it in her class, and she's a really good teacher. <laughs> so she's not gonna like then make a video about like something that didn't go well. So. A secret way to know if it's pretty good is like, did Amanda do a teacher tip video about it? Um, and if so, it's actually probably a pretty good one. <laughs> um, but the I understand that. Totally. Yeah, the other thing I would recommend is um, hold on a second here. On the teacher under teacher PD and teacher toolkit, we actually do have some best of lists if you've ever seen these before. So I went to teacher PD and clicked teacher toolkit. I went down here and then it's like NGPF's best resources right here. Have you seen these lists before? Okay, right. Yes, I have. Uh, someone directed me there for the non-tech stuff because yeah. I have so many kids not on the internet. Yep, exactly. And so like, but here's okay. like, hey, some of our favorites by unit. And okay. then here's the best ones we have for math. Here's the best ones we have for um like different things like data analysis role plays soft skills etc so like this is also kind of a good yeah. place to look yes i see that um here i can actually as long wonderful as you're thank you in, you're welcome as long as you're logged into your teacher account i'll put it over in the chat and you can link directly to it okay all right and is this where i would find is this the toolkit where I would also find the non-tech resources or are they just embedded every place? Nope, there is a list of, so I recently, Tim and I recently collaborated on a blog post that was like the top 10 non-tech resources. Um, that's on the blog. I like, think I looked at that. The non-tech are here and I wanna see if they're here. Hold on a second. I always struggle to find these non-tech. Yes, there it is. Um, so <laughs> that's that, that, okay. That was actually on the teacher toolkit under teacher and student resources. And okay. there's where you find the non-tech resources. Great, okay. As we had just started my credit union unit right before we were dismissed. Yeah. So I sent out a couple of these uh, fine prints and some of the things you already mentioned is what I already gave them. So I'm okay. preparing if I have to, because we what we did was for the three weeks out on April the 6th if we're still not out I have to figure out what to do then so yeah I'm assuming the packets can be sent out with the lunches so yeah that's where we're at good luck I don't envy any of you <laughs> well you guys are a um, fantastic resource for, thank you I wish I had something like this for more of my classes <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday we'll expand. We we have our work cut out for us right now. So, <laughs> uh, especially in this in this in this category, because things change. Like I can't imagine what's going to be coming up after this is all over. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. It's going to be unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were just even. So, and I haven't done the investing unit yet. Oh yeah, that's a big one. I mean, investing would be so hard to teach remotely. Well, oh, I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> the, um, uh, I was saving it. You were saving it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to say something. Wait, what else was I going to tell you? Oh, oh, the next, so in the month of April, we will be revising all of our managing credit uh activities and then i'm going to do a webinar on managing credit too so maybe it'll be in time for when you have to set out your next batch of, pa batch of packets if it comes oh, to yeah because i yeah you know, i did the i did the intro part so that would be great That'd yeah be perfect 
Cool. Anybody else have any other questions for me? I still right. see about 20 people left. Nothing? All right. Um, thank you all, the last 20 or so that are here. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for hanging on so long. Hopefully you got a lot out of even hearing the questions and little walkthroughs there. And um, I will look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.